Good afternoon, beautiful people. Welcome to another episode of Kiko's Free Thinkers Forum. We are at episode 108, and we're joined by a five-time guest. His name is Dr. Jack Rasmus. He's a retired professor of, of political economy at St. Mary's College of California in Moraga. And we've been, um, I guess, spoiled in a way to kind of get this knowledge from Dr. Rasmus over the previous four episodes. And you guys can go watch those previous episodes at 30, 56, 72, and 84. So um, just to show you the progression of the forum and also just the consistency of um, the guests coming up to the show, contributing to the show, to the growth of the channel. We really appreciate all of this. Uh, Dr. Rasmus is an author of several books. Uh, we've discussed in particular the scourge of neoliberalism, economic policy uh, from Reagan to Trump. We've talked about this quite a bit, this book, um, over the previous two episodes. Uh, episode 84 talks more about union um, involvement that Rasmus had just um, over the years and um, just the UAW strikes, um, the strikes in Hollywood, just a bunch of different things, labor movement um, going on in the States. And uh, he has a weekly radio show called Alternative Visions. Um, and I urge my audience to go to his blog, his active blog at um, his website that I'm going to link at the end of the episode description. So make sure you're checking the links out at the end of the episode description when we have guests coming on because um, that's a way for you to get in touch with these people consistently. But we have a lot to discuss today um, with no more commentary from my part. Before to add, I just want to say welcome to the show, uh, Dr. Rasmus, and we can't wait to have this conversation. Robert, let's, let's go. Yes, I'm um, excited for this. Um, I learned so much from our episodes, and I took extensive notes. Today, that wasn't mentioned in the introduction, is going to be a particular focus, um, a chapter that Rasmus contributed to Cynthia McKinney's book. If you all don't remember, Cynthia McKinney came onto this show, I believe it was episode 95. Um, so go back and watch episode 95 with Cynthia McKinney. She came out with the edited volume called When China Sneezes. Um, and the full title is From the Coronavirus Lockdown to the Global Political Economic Crisis. Uh, Jack Rasmus contributed a chapter entitled Does the 21st Century First Great Worldwide Depression Lie Ahead? And this was written within the context of Trump being president and in the height of COVID um, the, at the early stages of it. So we're going to talk about that and then we're going to transition maybe into some Russo-Ukrainian um, current updates and then maybe um, assess the presidential field as far as economic policies are concerned. Slight ad before we start, um, we've grown a lot. 42% of our audience is located outside of the United States. All we urge you to do is to subscribe for free, tell your friends and family. We're not asking for a dime, just a little bit of your time to expand your mind, and you can't unthink free thought. Um, let's continue with the show. Um, just support independent media. That would be my only advice. We have gotten some donations recently. Um, if you want to do that, that's totally up to you, but it's not um, recommended. If you want to, I'm not going to refuse the money. Of course not. But um, those simple gestures are definitely appreciated. But just subscribe for free if you want to, um, I guess, to answer the quick question. You know, how can you help this channel grow? Subscribe for free, like the videos, and share the content. That's the best way to do it. As far as reading your chapter and your contribution to Cindy McKinney's book, When China Sneezes, very interesting book. A lot, lots of different authors from different political ideologies, different economic theory um, bases. When I was reading your chapter, I was thinking of a word that I hear all the time that's called late stage capitalism. That's all I could think of just reading your book, especially at the beginning. And I was thinking, because you imply in the chapter that capitalism is the reason why these um, swings are happening so consistently with these recessions and um the banks have to make all these extreme measures to kind of keep the economy afloat. I want you to define to the audience, because I've never gotten this before, what is late stage capitalism? Do you subscribe to that idea that there is a such thing as late stage capitalism? And how will we see that as far as empirical terms? Like, how does that look empirically? Well, I would call it latest stage capitalism. <laughs> latest <laughs> yeah uh, you know capitalism is is a form of uh, of economy and uh, overlaying government 
uh, and politics um, that continuously uh, evolve. It has been evolving. Uh, whether this is, uh, you know, the late meaning almost through <laughs> stage of capitalism <clears throat> remains to be seen. Uh, only history will tell us that. Although, uh, uh, you know, there are some <clears throat> some real challenges for capitalism. Uh, and of course, uh, the U.S. is the centerpiece of global capitalism right now. It's uh, it, it's the, uh, the the heart of the empire, the global empire, uh, which is under threat and the change. We can talk about that too. Uh, but I've uh, said uh, repeatedly in recent years that uh, I, I think there's going to be a real crisis of the capitalist global capitalist system <clears throat> by mid-century. Uh, because there are three major contradictions that hasn't been able to resolve. It doesn't look like it's going to be able to resolve it. Uh, you know, one major contradiction uh, is uh, the climate crisis. I don't see uh, evidence uh, that it's uh, getting ahead of that curve. Uh, what we see is uh, continually the estimation of uh, the uh, uh, global warming uh, approaching one and a half percent centigrade. Uh, increased warming here is is coming sooner rather than later. Uh, the estimation of uh, that tipping point, as they say, uh, uh, used to be 2050, then 2040. It's somewhere less than that now. Uh, it doesn't look like, uh, despite some of the efforts, uh, that capitalism is going to be able to uh, uh, stop that warming here before it reaches a real crisis point, meaning uh, in economic terms, uh, too, too expensive for it to resolve, uh, private markets to resolve, in other words. So that that's by 2050, I think that's going to be a real test case for it. Another uh, a real test case is um, uh, the evolving of, uh, of, what's, of technology itself, uh, artificial intelligence in, in, in particular, you know, the latest form is generative AI, but uh, we're going we're, we're going to hit uh, what's called general AI in the 2030s, and that's a, a qualitative leap. And it's going to destroy, you know, massive hundreds of millions of jobs. Even Goldman Sachs Bank is predicting 300 million jobs will be impacted by 2030. Uh, and that's before even uh, general AI uh, hit, hits, the, hits the road here. Uh, so I think uh, that's going to be a problem because there's going to be so much mass unemployment you know, can capitalism somehow contain that? Uh, I don't think it can be, technology will, will create enough jobs to offset the, the massive job loss of low-skilled jobs uh, that's going to occur here because of uh, AI. And that trend has left the station, there's no doubt. AI, it's a massive uh, investment uh, thing going on right now. Uh, and, uh, you know, you can see it uh, boosting uh, business investment. Uh, it's, it's probably the only really game in town here now for business investment. Uh, the problem is uh, what's going to happen where all those people are going to be thrown out of work by 2050. Uh, will the system provide some sort of uh, universal income to keep them uh, placated or not? Uh, and that's going to be a problem that I don't see them being able to resolve. And then the final the third problem of capitalism long term, meaning mid mid century, uh, is uh, you know go going to be uh, the U.S. empire. What we're seeing now is the U.S. empire is cornered. The U.S. is cornered. Uh, it is the in decline. It's being challenged. Multipolar world, whatever you can see it accelerating because of the wars going on in Ukraine. Uh, the global South around the BRICS. Uh, with the core uh, Russia, China, and the Middle East uh, are uh, growing in power, political power, economic power, and influence. The U.S. is uh, desperately trying to circle the wagons of the rest of its empire, meaning the G7, G8 with Australia, uh, and uh, trying to uh, strike out uh, with military means uh, as a way of containing uh, you know, the development um, there's a big risk. There's a big risk that uh, uh, the U.S. and the empire, which is poorly led now, even in terms of their own uh, leadership qualities, really, really 
I've never seen such poor leadership qualities uh, in the empire. Uh, you know, may strike out, make uh, a big mistake, and we, we may trip into a tactical nuclear conflict with Russia or China, uh, and that's going to be devastating uh, for capitalism. So those are the three challenges long term I see for capitalism. Now, you know, it's been evolving uh, all along the way from 19th century to 20th century. Uh, and as I've been writing repeatedly, uh, you know, when at the end of World War II, the U.S. capital was, was dominant, no doubt. Uh, I mean, European capital capitalisms uh, uh, were devastated by the war and became totally dependent on the U.S. Uh, and uh, we had a big growth spurt uh, uh, sort of restoring the destruction of, of World War II here. Uh, and of course, the U.S. economy was boosted by the war. It wasn't destroyed, unlike, uh, you know, in Asia and Europe. Uh, and uh, the U.S. was uh, the number one hegemon, you might say. Um, uh, but that solution, uh, that restructuring of that economy that came out of World War II, where the U.S. became the global uh, hegemon, uh, involved certain new policies, fiscal policies and monetary policies, industrial trade, etc., cetera, uh, which I've talked about and described about, uh, particularly in my uh, early chapters of my book, The Scourge of Neoliberalism that you mentioned, uh, restructuring, global capitalist restructurings go on periodically uh, whenever there's a crisis or a great opportunity. Same thing happened after World War I. It was a great opportunity for the U.S., and it became the, 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 the co-hegemon with Britain. Uh, and, of course, uh, you know, uh, Britain and Europe uh, self-destructed in World War I and II. Really, they're one conflict uh, with, a, with a kind of a, a respite interim in the 20s and 30s, right? It's one big war. Uh, but that destroyed uh, the power of, uh, of uh, European capital, which was the, the leading capital, particularly the British. Uh, and then, of course, World War II kind of put the kibosh on the whole thing, and the U.S. evolved out of that. But the U.S. developed new, new policies in order to accommodate its new role in the empire as, as the slow hegemon. Uh, and uh, but that structure, that restructuring after World War II, as it did after World War I, that restructuring after World War II, those solutions, those policies uh, became less and less effective in maintaining the empire by the 1970s. And there was a crisis in the 1970s of economic growth and so forth, and political and domestic in the US uh, that uh, was then uh, addressed by you know, the capitalists in this country uh, with a set of policies that were called neoliberal. We've talked about that before, right, in the 1980s and beyond. And a new restructuring of fiscal, monetary, industrial trade policies that came out of that. Uh, well, by the 21st century, that set of policies began to break down. And those contradictions began to grow. It became less effective. And uh, we're seeing uh, slowly growing uh, since uh, the early decade of this century. Uh, a challenging and a weakening and a decline of the empire. Uh, you know, the peak of the empire was probably 2006-7. Uh, and then economically, we saw the, uh, the crisis uh, uh, ripen in, in, uh, in the 2008-9 uh, global financial crash uh, that the economy never really recovered fully from. Uh, the period following and under Obama was a subgrowth uh, about uh, two thirds at most of normal recovery from a recession. Uh, and that was a qualitatively different recession uh, that was associated with financial crisis, uh, precipitating it and then exacerbating uh, by the decline in the real economy. That was qualitatively something new in the evolution of, of uh, capital in the empire. Uh, and I said, uh, as I said, the solution uh, to it. Uh, uh, was uh, uh, not very efficient. Fiscal monetary policy has been declining in its efficiency, meaning its ability to stimulate the economy from a recession or its ability to contain inflation. Uh, that, those are like the twin indicators of the weakening of fiscal and monetary policies. Uh, 
And uh, we see it again in uh, the even worse contraction uh, under COVID. Uh, we see this qualitatively worse recession, which I call an epic recession, uh, to distinguish it from normal, quote, normal recessions. It was qualitatively different animal, 2008-9, right? And therefore, the recovery of the old tools, fiscal monetary policy, were not as effective as they used to be. And then we have the COVID crash, uh, which was even worse. Uh, for example, uh, when we had the crash in 2008-9, and of course, that's the U.S. Uh, globally, uh, in Europe and Japan, it extended beyond that uh, time period. Uh, when we had that crash, uh, the U.S. government fiscal monetary policies that threw about four to five trillion dollars uh, into the stimulus pot. Uh, four trillion in fiscal, I mean, in monetary policy, and another trillion or two maybe uh, in um, uh, fiscal policy, government spending, tax cuts, and so forth. That's fiscal. Monetary policy is what's called QE, throw liquidity into the economy, save the bank, save the investors. Hopefully, they then spend it, uh, you know, in investing. Uh, well, that was like four to five trillion dollars uh, to get a, a, a weak recovery. Uh, in terms of GDP for, for the next six or seven years. Uh, well, then we get the COVID crash, uh, which was even deeper. And uh, we threw $9 trillion, you know, not five, but $9 trillion, the fiscal monetary stimulus at it. And what did we get? We got an even weaker GDP recovery going on than we did during the Obama recovery from the 2008-9. So if you look at the big picture here, we're spending more and more fiscal monetary stimulus to get less and less of a real GDP recovery. That signals a kind of long-term weakening of, of the economy that eventually is going to require another major restructuring and a whole new way of looking at fiscal monetary industrial policy, which is coming, I think, this decade at some, at some point. Uh, so you got to look at that big picture. Uh, and it's also reflected in the fact that um, the, the fiscal stimulus being less effective, less efficient, right, is also less efficient in, in its uh, reverse of trying to contain inflation. Uh, in other words, it's, it's, it's inefficient and there are contradictions in two ways, two directions. One in stimulating recovery, it does, you got to spend more and more to get less and less of a recovery in GDP. At the same time, you got to cut uh, stimulus more and more to contain inflation. Mm -hmm. And what we got now is they haven't really cut the stimulus enough to contain the inflation enough. We brought inflation down from nine, ten percent officially. It's actually more than that, the CPI, to about four or five percent. Uh, so we brought it down with raising interest rates, for example, to five and a half percent. That's not enough to really shake out uh, services inflation, for example, uh, and uh, bring bring down uh, uh, inflation even more. We're stuck at the five to five and a half percent services inflation, and now goods inflation, particularly. Uh, energy goods and, and other goods are going back up. So we're not getting that inflation down anymore and it's creeping back up the last two months. And the Fed can't and won't raise interest rates further because it tried to do so in 23 and wanted to do it provoked a regional banking crisis, right? So it knows it cannot raise interest rates above what it is. We're, we're, we're not going to see further interest rate hikes uh, but we're not probably going to see much in the way of interest rate uh, uh, cuts either for the rest of the year. You know, they're still talking well, two or three of the Fed cuts later in the year. I don't think that's going to happen. Certainly nothing's going to happen through June in terms of rate cuts. All this is indication that monetary policy uh, is, is sort of uh, uh, stymied. Uh, it can't really bring down inflation anymore. Uh, and it can't afford to stimulate the economy because that raises that inflation even more. Uh, so the Fed is stuck, uh, you know, between a rock and a hard place and fiscal, I mean, monetary policy is kind of neutralized right now. At the same time, you've got fiscal policy uh, that's creating these massive government deficits 
you know, more and more fiscal stimulus uh, is is really an issue here uh, because we got what thirty four trillion dollars national debt now. And that's not counting, by the way, the nine trillion dollars federal Fed Federal Reserve debt. You got to add that Federal Reserve monetary debt on top of the thirty four trillion congressional national debt. So you know, it's really like 40 some trillion. Then you got to add state and local government debt. Uh, you know, I don't know what that is. That's maybe 3 trillion or something, you know. So, so we're close to, uh, you know, close to $50 trillion in government entity debt now. Uh, now, you know, there's a, there's a school of economics, modern monetary theory that says that, uh, uh, you know, it doesn't matter. Government debt doesn't matter. The deficit doesn't matter. And the debt doesn't matter. The debt is just the accumulation of annual deficits, which are running way over a trillion dollars every year now, right? Chronically. Uh, they say it doesn't matter. Well, in a way, it doesn't matter uh, if you're growing, but we're not growing very well. Uh, okay. Uh, and uh, what does matter is the interest on that debt that you're going to have to pay. And we are paying, we're like six, seven hundred billion a year now. Uh, and as long as interest rates go uh, stay high, it's going to continue rising. And some are predicting, you know, nine hundred billion dollars interest payment on the debt is going to happen, uh, you know, in the next four or five years. Nine hundred billion dollars a year. Now that nine hundred billion dollars is important because the government is going to pay the bondholders that borrow the, you know, treasuries uh, that represent that debt. Right? They're going to continue to pay, uh, you know, bankers and investors and so forth and foreign and domestic uh, uh, in order to protect the dollar. If they didn't pay it, the dollar would crash, right? Uh, so uh, somehow they're going to have to pay that seven, nine hundred billion dollars a year every year, which means they're going to crowd out social programs spending. Uh, it's a trade-off. You pay the bondholders or you maintain your social program spending. You know, which includes Social Security, Medicare, you know, Medicaid, and, and all the other transportation, education, healthcare, all that, right? Uh, those are critical social programs. Uh, and uh, cutting that is called austerity. So, is it going to trade off between paying the bondholders or social programs? Because the defense spending is not going down either, as the empire is challenged. The defense spending is going up, right? Uh, we've over 200 billion already on Ukraine, and then they're preparing uh, for the war in uh, China by 2030. And then they got the blank check for Israel, uh, you know, and then they got the U.S. Navy in the Red Sea. Uh, you know, I mean, the, the defense spending, which worsens the, uh, you know, the deficit and the debt, there's no sign that that's going to change. And there's no sign that they're going to raise taxes on the rich corporations. Uh, after Trump gave him $4 trillion in 2018, right? No sign of that. Uh, and in fact, you know, we've, we've cut uh, taxes, uh, which worsens the deficit and the debt uh, by over $15 trillion since 2001. $15 trillion of uh, tax cuts, mostly for investors and businesses, corporations, the wealthy 1%, right? Mostly for them, 80% of that's for, for them. At the same time, we spent eight, nine trillion dollars on wars, right? There, there's like 25 trillion of your 34 trillion uh, national debt right there. There's no sign they're going to change that. That's fiscal policy. So that's entering a crisis, right? No tax hikes or running up of the deficit and, and the debt on all these government agencies, right? And paying more interest on the debt. Uh, that's a contradiction. That's going to continue as a problem. And that deficit and debt's going to continue going up. And so is the interest payments on it going to go up. And the pressure to cut social programs is going to intensify because they're not going to cut war spending. All right. So that's that crisis. And then we have the monetary crisis I talked about that the Fed can't raise interest rates to cut inflation even more because of the exacerbating uh, a banking crisis. Uh, and the Fed is kind of increasingly stuck between a rock and a hard place as well. And when it cuts the interest rates, it doesn't stimulate the economy like in a recession very much anymore because capitalism has become global and financialized. And all that money that the Fed tries to throw into the economy either gets sucked off into 
investments uh, by the U.S. Uh, capitalists globally doesn't help the U.S. economy. It, it sort of seeps out of the economy, goes through uh, uh, expansion of U.S. capital, uh, multinational corporations around the world, uh, if they borrow the money from the Fed, uh, or it goes into financial asset markets instead of the real economy. Uh, and that doesn't boost the real economy at all when it goes into stocks and bonds and derivatives and foreign and currency exchange and all that, right? So monetary policy to stimulate the economy is growing increasingly inefficient, right? Can't raise without exacerbating a financial system, can't stimulate because the money seeps out. So that's broken. Monetary policy is broken. It can only operate within an increasingly narrow space. And then we got fiscal policy that's broken because you got this huge de uh, deficit and debt that's growing, and they won't do anything about correcting it by raising taxes on the rich or by cutting more spending. They're going to try to cut uh, domestic uh, social programs. Uh, so those two key key uh, levers of uh, of uh, the economy and the global empire are increasingly inefficient, meaning they don't work very well as, you know, and whenever that happens, uh, capitalism tries to find a way to restructure itself, is what I'm saying. So we're approaching uh, another re major restructuring, uh, if they can maintain it, right, uh, here in the next, next decade. Uh, that that's inevitable. They have to do it. But at the same time, they have this other big problem of their empire uh, in decline. <clears throat> and uh, what are they going to do about that? And, and, you know, it's so obvious in the 21st century, the quality of the capitalist political leadership in this country is really pathetic. Uh, I mean, when you look at George W. Bush, right? Uh, I mean, the guy who ran the government was Cheney. It wasn't Bush. Bush was just a, a front guy there. Mm -hmm. And then you get Obama, uh, you know, had a lot of promise, uh, but Obama turned out to be a, you know, a premier opportunist. <laughs> he just did what he was told. You know, he could have fixed it, but he did what he was told. Uh, and now he's living the high life on Martha's Vineyard, right? Uh, I'm writing an article, by the way, uh, that I'll peer, peer uh, you know, within next week about how U.S. presidents become multimillionaires, right? And uh, it, it, the way the U.S. system works, uh, they become multimillionaires when they leave office. You know, it's not like a banana republic where they dip in. You know, the leaders <laughs> dip into, in, in, into the uh, cookie cookie jar while they're still in office. No, it's when they leave that they're they're given all this wealth and everything. Rather than go there, let me just continue. Uh, but uh, you know, Obama it was it was a broken promise opportunity, uh, and then uh, we get Trump. Obama creates Trump, by the way. It was you know the the lack of growth and the problems that weren't resolved under Obama really paved the way for Donald Trump. And then of course you know you get a, a, a Hillary, which only made it more uh, uh, likely. In 2016, a totally arrogant, incompetent <laughs> uh, politician, uh, and uh, you know, if you look at the the history under neoliberalism, uh, the Democrats create the, this rightward swing uh, that we've been seeing for decades now. I mean, the failures of Jimmy Carter uh, in the late '70s paved the way, made possible Ronald Reagan and the onset of neoliberalism, right? Uh, and, and then you get this guy Dukakis, what a joke, you know, uh, uh, I mean, really a comical figure. Uh, and then you get uh, Bill Clinton in the 90s, well, he paves the way, his lack of uh, a policy effectiveness paved the way for George W. Bush, with help, of course, from the Supreme Court. Uh, and then you get uh, uh, Obama, which makes who, who makes uh, Trump possible, right? And now you got Biden, who is making Trump 2.0 uh, possible, right? I, don't, I mean, all the all the signs, and we can talk about it later. All the signs are uh, that uh, Biden's going to lose here. It's not that Trump's going to win; it's that Biden's going to lose, right? Okay, so. Uh, uh, the quality, the point is the quality of the capitalist political elite here in the 21st century in particular is, is really pretty pathetic. I mean, they can't even maintain their own empire. 
in foreign policy, they are, uh, you know, the puppets, the, the marionettes of, uh, of the neocons who've been running policy in this country, you know, to dev foreign policy with devastating uh, um, complications here since 1999. Right? And we see this uh, in, in the Ukraine war and these other wars and so forth. Uh, so uh, foreign policy is, uh, is, is just uh, incredibly uh, uh, inept. Uh, they can't even maintain their own empire anymore. Uh, but you know that's that's typical. You you know when when you get a crisis and a decline, uh, you know it, it's it's like a scummy pond. All the scum rises and still waters to the top, uh, and that's what we got in terms of leadership. We got the uh, uh, you know it's rising to the top. The worst is 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 appearing, uh, which only exacerbates the the problem. Uh, but to get back to the main point, you know what I'm what I'm talking about is uh, in the 21st century, not only politics and foreign policy, uh, but the economy is is slowly grinding, uh, slowing down, and, and it's hard to see uh, because it happens slowly over an extended period of time. Uh, but the 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 deep crises of 2008-10 recessions, qualitative deep recessions, COVID-2021 recession uh, are, uh, are linked, uh, but they are also an indication uh, of uh, uh, growing problems in the economy. The recessions are getting deeper, right? And harder to recover from. And the fiscal monetary tools of doing it are becoming less effective. Uh, of stimulating a recovery, or when we get uh, you know a crisis in terms of uh, inflation, uh, then uh, increasingly ineffective in in dealing with it. And along the way, uh, these policies are are feeding the rich more and more. Uh, they, they're becoming not sources of stabilizing the economy, but tools that subsidize. Uh, the super rich, you know, the one percent and their corporations. Uh, wh what does it take to be part of the one percent uh, wealthiest one percent households in, in the U.S.? What what is their uh, uh, annual income? The flow of income, seven hundred eighty-five thousand dollars a year in income to be within the one percent. Uh, how about their net worth? Their their wealth? What's the one percent threshold for wealth? $33 million, right? That's, you gotta be $33 million in net assets. In other words, your value of the assets minus your, your debt uh, to be uh, uh, 33 million and in the 1%. And your annual income is 785,000 is, is the low, low level of that. Of course, the more income you have, the more assets you can buy and the wealth you can generate. And the more wealth you generate, the more income you throw off. So those two feed each other. Uh, and that's growing. Uh, and if you look at uh, the U.S. economy, most of the growth when we have it, even though it's slowing down, is going to uh, income that flows to the 1%. Right? Uh, during uh, uh, the Clinton years, I think it was 48% uh, of GDP income created went to the 1%, 48%. Right? And uh, during George Bush, uh, that increased to 65% of all the GDP net income growth accrued to the 1%. Right? So it's getting, it was getting worse. Under Obama, 95% of the growth GDP accrued in income to the 1%. Now, I don't know what the number is yet under Biden, Trump, but we'll, we'll see. I'm sure it's, it's quite the same thing. So increasingly, you know, the neoliberals on over time, uh, the wealth that is created, even though it's slowing down, the wealth is accruing more and more to the wealthy in this country. Well, that's a sign of uh, uh, not just decadence, but a sign of uh, uh, an imbalance, a serious imbalance in, in the economy. And you can see that in the wages, you know, the wages, uh, uh, wage gains, real wage gains after inflation have been flat or declining uh, for the median and you know, the 80, 90 million of, uh, uh, of the 130 million households in this country. Right? Uh, so they're sort of marking time or going backwards in terms of real income. 
while the 1%, 2%, 5% uh, get richer and richer. And they're not doing anything to correct that. You know Why aren't they doing anything? Because those who are getting the money don't want to stop getting the money. And they control the politicians now uh, because uh, you know money is, uh, the money spigot is totally open and it's all flowing in campaigns uh, to the wealthy uh, representatives of, of, of uh, the wealthy classes. Uh, you know, so the political structure is, is uh, accommodating this wealth and income inequality accumulation, and it's not going to change. Right? Uh, well, what, what, what does the working class do? Um, how is it maintaining itself? You know, why isn't it in revolt, <laughs> right, politically? Well, it kind of is in a revolt here and there. Uh, politically, uh, but uh, you know the the working class, the middle class, is is sort of finding ways of uh, sort of keeping the wolf from the door. Uh, you know what are those ways? Well, if you look at the recent statistic, credit card debt now way over a trillion dollars. People are using credit cards, uh, and now they're beginning to default on those cards uh, more and more because they're getting maxed out. They're using credit cards. Uh, to supplement the lack of wage income, right? Uh, they're also uh, withdrawing 401k Ks from their 401ks at a historically high rate uh, to, you know, maintain their income for spending that they're not getting from wage wage gains. Uh, they're also uh, retiring at uh, 62 uh, in collecting Social Security. Uh, as a way of doing it, or uh, a, a Social Security disability, finding ways of uh, of claiming that. Uh, you know, the biggest category of Social Security claimants are uh, 62 years old. About 30 percent, almost of, of uh, those on Social Security are claiming it at at uh, 62. Uh, so that's another indication of ways of trying to supplement. And then they're working second and third jobs, part time jobs. You know, you look at all the job numbers and they're really talking about, oh, job creation, job creation, 200,000 a month or whatever. Uh, I've talked about in some detail, it's not totally accurate, but, you know, there is job creation going on. But if you look at the uh, Labor Department's uh, current population survey uh, for jobs, uh, it's all, all part-time jobs. Full-time jobs are not growing, according to the CPS survey. Uh, but we got a huge increase going on in part-time jobs. Well, that's people taking on second or third jobs, you know. Uh, but uh, you know, the Biden administration says, "Oh, look at all the job creation, all the job creation, uh, second and third jobs, mostly in the last uh, year or two. Before that, it was all people returning to work." You know, uh, Biden says, "Oh, I created 13 million jobs." Well, nine million of those were people who were laid off and just simply returned to work. You didn't create those jobs; people just restored and went back to work. But he's claiming he created them. See, but in the last two years, uh, there has been some job creation, but it's mostly been part-time tent jobs, gig jobs. <laughs> okay, so that's uh, the reality of how people are coping. Families are coping uh, with this. Uh, situation of a lack of income as inflation continues chronically and it is chronically stuck now i think five six percent we're going to see it continue uh, to drift upward over the summer here as uh, uh, we've got energy gasoline prices uh, rising once again uh, certain food prices uh, rising again as uh, monopolies uh, price gouge on food particularly the processed food you know where you have uh, monopolies, monopolization of the economy, three or four big producers, you know, make cereal and so forth, processed food. That, that's what's going up. Uh, you know, vegetables and fruit is very seasonal. That's not really going up that much. Um, but anyway, that's chronic. Inflation's chronic. Uh, interest rates are, are chronically uh, high uh, and remain so. And by the way, if you're a monopoly company, you pass on the interest rates in your price. Uh, so higher interest rates are actually stimulating some of the inflation, not reducing some of the inflation. Uh, but to get back to the bigger picture, you know, uh, we have these more severe uh, contractions going on 
here in uh, the 21st century. We've got fiscal monetary policies that aren't working as well in the 21st century. And we got the US empire uh, that's being challenged globally and uh, like a wolf being cornered is snapping out and uh, engaging in force military action uh, instead of uh, diplomatic uh, <clears throat> action uh, because the elites are, um, are not as competent either. You know, I mean, the neocons are kind of dumb, I think. Uh, they're, they're responsible for the destruction going on in the U.S. US empire. Uh, you know, their problem is uh, uh, they don't really understand economics and the, the real lay of the land. They're, they're like bulls in the China shop, you know, just charging forward military force, military force for every, every issue. And uh, they're losing. Uh, and failing, but uh, they only have one gear that's forward, you see, and uh, they just double down uh, every time uh, they have a fuck up, uh, which, of course, Ukraine is a big fuck up for them, and they're going to pay the price for that. Uh, and then their policies with regard to Israel, you know, supporting no ceasefire, I mean, that's reverberating around the world. Uh, uh, and then uh, there's this. U.S. Navy in the, in the Red Sea is having no effect except a big cost to maintain, you know, task forces out there. Uh, and then uh, they're trying to prepare for a war with China, right, the big one. Uh, and, uh, you know, we, we've got this uh, huge deficit. We're more spending over a trillion dollars easily. Uh, Pentagon, 850, 850 billion is only part of the total war spending going on really about 1.1, 1.2 trillion here a year. And interest is going up seven, 800 billion a year, right? So the war, war spending and interest, on, it's like 2 trillion of discretionary spending. Uh, well, where are we going to get the money from? Well, they're going to just try to finance it pretty much. Uh, okay, so uh, that's my my, my view of the global economy, you step back and take a big picture look, you know, in terms of time frame and say, well, what's going on in the 21st century? Uh, it's, a, it's a clearly an economic and political picture of U.S. decline, slowly. It's like, uh, you know, the, the building is fragmenting, uh, fracturing at the foundations here. It hasn't collapsed yet, right? Uh, but the signs are not, are not good. I just going to your chapter and thanks for that explanation and um, kind of the progression of these different periods. But I want to revisit uh, when you were commenting earlier, because I, I have to be honest with you, reading the article or the chapter, I want to make sure I understood stood this correct. I was surprised because I think you were making a comparison between right before the onset of the 08-09 crisis you seem to imply that the economy was in a better position compared to right before the onset of the COVID crisis um, in um, 1920. I thought that was an interesting, um, you know, explanation that you gave right there. But then I was thinking about this buzzword. I, I, I like to say it this way, saving the banks or being too big to fail, I, I kept thinking about that was always a big um, selling point during that period in 08, 09. The banks are too big to sell, fail, we got to save them. You also stated earlier in the chapter about how 17,000 banks failed because the Fed didn't, you know, save the banks in during the Great Depression era, 1930 through 32. I guess my question is this. Um, we know that there were bailouts that happened in 08, 09. Um, was that the right decision in retrospect? And um, if it was the right decision, what consequences did it have, even if it would have been the right decision, considering the crisis at the time? What effects can we still feel from that um, result of actions that, that the Fed did do in 08, 09? Well, okay, you got to back up and you got to understand that part of the neoliberal revolution, in, in other words, the crisis of the 70s, how did they uh, restore, they, the capitalists, restore uh, the economy 
and their global role in the economy and their political role in the economy. Neoliberalism under Reagan is, is, a, is a restoration. It's a restructuring of the economy. But part of that restructuring uh, had to do with uh, financializing the global economy, right? Financialization, uh, in other words, uh, uh, expanding the financial side of the economy, you know, the banks and the shadow banks and so forth. Uh, how did that, that occur? Well, that occurred because the Federal Reserve just kept throwing liquidity money into the system uh, time and time again uh, at, at, at every little excuse. And this is called the Greenspan put. You know, put means you're throwing money into, into the system. Greenspan becomes the Fed chair in 1986, right? And uh, what, what the what begins then is this massive Fed injection of liquidity over and over and over, uh, which it expands uh, the U.S. globally. You know, if if U.S. companies are going to expand around the globe, which they do, starting with Reagan, we have an offshoring. Remember that offshoring. Uh, U.S. companies started moving abroad into the empire. That's part of the rise and expansion of U.S. Uh, empire. Uh, in the 80s, the real economy. Well, you got to accommodate that with financial expansion uh, to fuel uh, that that global expansion. So in, in the 80s, we have globalization as a result of certain policies, tax policies, and so forth, conscious by Congress and the president, right? And we have financialization, global financialization going on. We have the creation of these new financial markets and new instruments, financial instruments called derivatives expand, right? New markets, new derivatives, and uh, financialization is a quick uh, and accelerating way for capitalists to expand their profits. Financial, you know, with financial markets, uh, you don't have to create actual things, you know, you create the securities, derivatives, and so forth, and you buy and sell them and you get rich off of that rather than creating real goods and things, right? Both are going on. There's real goods and things being created, but the financial things, instruments are, are growing even faster and you're getting more profits from that than you are from making goods. But you're getting profits from goods too, right? So Part of neoliberalism is uh, they find these ways, they, the capitalists, to make profits over profits, you know? and it becomes very profitable. But you get this financialization going on, which was enabled ultimately by the Federal Reserve throwing trillions of dollars into the economy since the 1980s. You know, Greenspan finally leaves in 2006 after 20 years, uh, but that, that flooding of that liquidity uh, leads to financial speculation and financial risk taking, and uh, the, in, the the institutions that did that were the shadow banks primarily. You know, the hedge funds and private equity and all these unregulated sectors of the finance system. And it's that sector uh, that tripped the two thousand seven eight nine crisis, and that spilled over to the regulated commercial banks eventually and shut down the credit system in 2008 that caused the rest of the real economy to collapse. You see that whole process there of financial instability leading to the real economy uh, crashing was kind of new. Right? Up until then, recessions uh, were not really financially precipitated or exacerbated. They were just, you know, sectors of the real economy got out of whack and grew too fast and others, and they had to consolidate. And that, therefore, recessions were very short and shallow. But when you get the financial precipitated recessions, they're deeper. They're deeper and harder to get out of. But the solution to get out of them in the 21st century was the Fed to guess what? throw more money at it. So the crisis ultimately due to too much liquidity and speculation became the solution in the short term. And the Fed threw $4 trillion at the banks that were in trouble in 2008. But it became a habit, you see, of the Fed doing this. And when we had the COVID crisis, what did the Fed do? It threw $5 trillion at the banks that didn't need it this time. 
you know, it thought, the Fed thought, well, we're going to have another 2008 crisis. We better flood the markets, right, with all this excess cash and liquidity. Well, the banker said, yeah, great. You know, investors said, yeah, throw it our way. QE, we love it, right? It's free money. It's essentially free money, zero interest rates, free money, right? You had big companies like uh, uh, Apple, which uh, was sitting on $252 billion in cash borrowing because the interest rate was zero. Mm -hmm. They would borrow that money, and then instead of using it to invest, you know, Apple is a case example of this, they would just give it to their shareholders in stock buybacks and dividend payouts. This was going on all over and has been. And it's one of the reasons why the 1% is getting so filthy rich, you know? So you can trace it back to Fed monetary policies and zero interest rates, QE and all that, which just gets shuffled right back into the shareholders' hands, right? And this is going on globally, you know, because now you've got the, uh, uh, with financialization globally, you've got these financial asset markets everywhere around the world. And the investor elites, you know, uh, through their shadow bank institutions and all these new financial securities derivatives, right, can invest anywhere in the world. And then you add technology, communications technology, uh, which links them all, all these financial markets and institutions are global and linked. And you can move your money around instantaneously now to all the different financial asset markets uh, and, and grow your wealth as a result. Well, that's the financialization of capitalism. Uh, that's really a characteristic of uh, the neoliberal and 21st century period, right? That financialization. But the financialization and too much liquidity leads to financial instability events like we saw with the crash in 2008 and 9, and the regional banking problem that we had recently and so forth. It, it's like fermenting. The financial instability is fermenting. And uh, it, it uh, because it has so much weight now, it uh, tends to drag down the real economy from time to time. Right? Uh, you look at what's going on now in recent years, uh, the shadow banks like private equity are buying up all the real uh, real businesses. They're, they're just gobbling them up, you know, and taking them over. Not, not the commercial banks. I'm not talking about J.P. Morgan, Chase, and Wells, you know. It's the shadow bankers, you know, the Apollos and all those that are gobbling up the real economy. I mean, it's, it's like a cancer. Shadow banks are a cancer. Financialization is a cancer uh, eating the capitalist system itself. But it's global because it's a globalized economy now, right? everywhere. Uh, so these are the main trends, financial globalization. Now, if you go back, uh, you know, to the 1930s, as you, uh, you know, referred to, what, what you had was a Federal Reserve that did not throw money into the banks. And that's why we had uh, such a deep contraction. You know, we had, uh, as I've written about several times, uh, you have uh, what the uh, in 1929, you have the stock market crash, but the real economy was weakening even before the stock market crash. The stock market crash, a financial crash, exacerbated the downturn. What did the Fed do? Well, it didn't throw money into the banking system, and that instability uh, from the stock market spread to the banking system. And in 1930, we had a banking crash. And we had another banking crash in 31. And another one in 32 and 33. We had a series of banking crashes that exacerbated uh, the contraction of the real economy. And 17,000 uh, banks went under. But, and it wasn't until 1934 uh, that uh, the banks were stabilized, uh, creating the uh, FDIC and some other institutions and uh, once that happened, there were no banking crashes. They stopped. And then the economy, the real economy, slowly tr you know, struggling and recovered through slowly during the rest of it, with stops and goes uh, through the rest of the 1930s. Uh, and then, of course, it got a big fiscal stimulus there, not only from the New Deal, which is only a partial stimulus, social programs, but the, the war was a big stimulus. Uh, and, and that's how they really got out of uh, uh, you know, the New Deal plus the war is how they really got out of the crisis of the 30s. But 
what you saw in the, in, in the depths of the Great Depression of the 30s, 29 to 33, uh, was this problem of uh, they didn't throw enough money at the banks to bail them out. Uh, and uh, everything just ratcheted down. Well, that's the obverse of what we're seeing in the 21st century. We're throwing too much money at the whole thing and destabilizing it, right? And it's, you know, it's an example of, uh, in, the in the early 30s, the failure of monetary policy and fiscal policy. They were not spent on social programs sufficiently uh, until, of course, uh, the New Deal came around uh, to stimulate the real economy. Uh, but the system they set up, they learned from the 30s, you know, monetary and fiscal policy, how to stimulate the economy. Uh, and it worked in the post-war period for several decades, uh, but then that began to break down in the 1970s. You know, I mean, these restructurings last three, you know, three or four decades, uh, and then the contradictions uh, increase uh, and uh, the, the policies don't work so well. When you see the policies not working so well, you know you're reaching uh, the, the end of that uh, restructuring period and capitalism has to come up with another set of restructuring here, uh, which is approaching once again here in the, in the 2020s. Uh, and it's, uh, it's not just a domestic uh, restructuring, but it's a, it's a global restructuring because the global economy is bifurcating as a result of these uh, uh, failed policies going on. Uh, we have a bifurcation of the empire the U.S. global empire, the South, you know, uh, a third of uh, the, the, the South, you know, uh, out rallying around the BRICS, which are expanding now with all the Middle East, the petrol countries, right, joining it. And I think there's like 30 some other countries that want to join the BRICS. Uh, and uh, there's going to be a big uh, uh, conference here later in the year uh, of, of the BRICS uh, in Russia, I think in Petersburg. And, uh, they're going to come up with their own alternative uh, currency, global currency and uh, international payment system and IMF-like institutions, right, that are going to run parallel to the U.S. institutions, World Bank, IMF. Uh, and uh, the U.S. is rallying its core of, of uh, economic uh, uh, allies, you know, Europe, uh, Japan, Australia, New Zealand, the G8, right, you might say, They're rallying those around. It's kind of like they're rallying their wagons here, as, as the Indians, <laughs> to use the metaphor, are beginning to attack them, right? Uh, and so you're going to see this core, G G8 core of the U.S. empire, uh, and you're going to see the new global south and competing in similar institutions. And then maybe a third of the world economy is gonna to try to play one off against the other, right? They're not gonna to align to, to either and they're gonna play ball with them. And, and there will be some exchange between the, you know, the new challengers and, uh, and the old empire, uh, but it's gonna be a, a, a bifurcated world. You know, uh, I, I'm Putin likes to talk about the multipolar. Uh, well, it's gonna be a new bipolar as, as I see it. Uh, multi-countries, but new bipolar uh, arrangement. Uh, and that's what's foreseeable for the next uh, uh, decade, maybe. Uh, we'll, we'll see what happens here. Uh, but uh, very clearly, uh, uh, not only are the domestic fiscal monetary policies uh, facing contradictions and ineffectiveness, but the global, right? The global policy means the dominance of the dollar, which is going to go away as a uh, global uh, trading and, and uh, reserve currency. It, it won't go away. Uh, it's gonna have to share the world uh, with the new currencies and new, uh, new inst you know, international institutions that are gonna be created by the BRICS of the global South. Um, does, that, does that answer your question? I mean, tying into co comparability to what happened in the early thirties to what happened today, right? Right. Absolutely. But, you know, we saw a restructuring coming out of that crisis in the in the 30s, right, overlaid with the war, which accelerated the restructuring that began in 44, 45. Right. Uh, well, we've got wars now that are accelerating the contradictions and therefore the need for another restructuring. Let's revisit 
because the first time you came on, I believe it was episode 30, and it was a different context. We still talked about economics. We talked about these loans that the IMF um, gave to Ukraine back in 2014. Um, people just seem to forget that, oh, Russia invaded Ukraine, and they just fast forward. They don't think about the context, you know, leading up to, and then the NATO expansion. Um, Finland um, joined NATO, I believe, last year um, in the spring, and then Sweden recently just joined. Uh, very recently just joined NATO. And we talked about that the encroachment towards Russia, basically Russia's backyard. And um, the whole mantra, if you move an inch closer to the east, you know you know what we're going to do back. And, but regardless of that, the first context we met uh, when we came in episode 30 was about your contributions in um, a book entitled, um, guys, it's even leaving me right now because Flashpoint in Ukraine. Flashpoint in Ukraine is leaving me because I wanted to um, give a shout out. Unfortunately, Stephen Lindman passed. Um, Stephen Lindman um, was um, a big part of that. He collaborated with all these different authors. You were um, a very important contributor to that uh, book, Flashpoint in Ukraine, How the U.S. Drive for Hegemony Risk World War III. And a Matthew Witt, who has also been on the forum several times. A Cynthia McKinney, who's also been on the forum. There are just a plethora of authors. A Michael Hudson. Uh, so many different, um, diverse writers and thinkers, um, you know, really put that piece together. They talked about um, really the Orange uh, Revolution. Talked about the Euromaidan, um, which we've discussed. That we've had Medea Benjamin on. Uh, she discussed you know, basically kind of overlap what you were talking about as far as um, the context that was missing, I think, from the mainstream media, deliberately um, missing out the context of people are just dumb and dumber. Um, we know that they do this all the time. That's what the media is the best at, the mainstream media is. But I wanted to get to the current situation in the, the Russo-Ukrainian um, war. And I just had, had to say this. Six months, think about something, people, beautiful people out there listening. Six months, what happened to Zelensky? You would think he's dead. I mean, it's like he disappeared because I've been tracking this pretty carefully. And I'm like, you don't hardly ever hear about Zelensky in the mainstream media. You hear about Putin all the time, but it's like, Zelensky? What happened to him? And it's just, I'm wondering what is behind that. And can you give an update on the actual, you know, war? Okay, yeah. Um, well, you know, the Ukraine war is a centerpiece to all the changes that are occurring. As I said, uh, uh, it's it's accelerating the crisis. You know, the global U.S. hegemony crisis, as well as domestic uh, uh, economic policy crises going on, uh, as wars tend to do. They tend to be locomotives of history. They accelerate the changes and contradictions that are already. Uh, occurring. And that's true of uh, the Ukraine war. Uh, the, the U.S. Uh, media has become more propagandist uh, than ever before. You know, uh, it's, it's just, a, you know, a funnel for the official views uh, of U.S. policy. You know, I'm talking about CNN, MSNBC, New York Times, all that stuff, right? Uh, and, and you won't get a, a true picture of what's happening in Ukraine or has happened or will happen uh, from that source. You're going to have to go on the Internet and scour all around the world to get alternative views. Uh, and, uh, you know, bas basically uh, uh, that war has been lost, that militarily that war is, is, has been decided. You know, Ukraine is, is, is going to lose that war. And the West is beginning to realize that as well. You're even getting uh, uh, the, the beginning um, uh, commentary on that, you know, in the Council of Foreign Relations, uh, which is the big think tank for the U.S. Uh, empire. Uh, and uh, it, it's slipping through into the media, Wall Street Journal, Washington Post, and so forth, uh, that uh, it cannot be sustained. Uh, and uh, that whole Ukraine project uh, is, is a failure. Uh, a, a good marker of that is one of its main uh, advocates, Victoria Newland, has just resigned. Oh, which, yeah. <laughs> which, is, which is the sign that, uh, okay, uh, 
uh, Victoria, you know, you, you neocons have failed this and, you know, it's not going to go forward and she's jumping ship. Uh, she's not gone. She'll be back somewhere. Uh, but uh, uh, clearly, uh, you know, the U.S. cannot continue to uh, fund it. You know, the 61 billion is not going to pass here. And as uh, uh, Ukraine continues to lose on, on the battlefront, uh, it's going to become less likely that the U.S. is going to want to throw more money at it. Uh, so uh, even more, less likely that, that that will get passed. Uh, and without the U.S. Uh, financial support and weapons support, uh, it cannot win. Uh, and, and I've been writing a series of articles and probably will we'll produce a, a book of articles on this uh, before the end of the year uh, as the thing winds down. Uh, and uh, you can check these articles out on my blog, jackrasmus.com, particularly the ones uh, that I wrote at the beginning of the war uh, and at the first year uh, history uh, entitled uh, 10 Reasons Why the U.S. May Want Russia to Invade Ukraine. U.S. wanted them to <laughs> because there was a lot to be gained and has been gained, by the way. Uh, it, it's not a total loss, because if you remember under uh, under Trump, uh, it looked like the U.S. was going to pull away from uh, uh, NATO. Right. And NATO was, was in uh, shambles. Right. Well, one thing this war did was to restore U.S. control over NATO using some of the smaller you know, Baltic and other East European states as allies and pretty much uh, forcing, you know, the big players, France and in Germany to go along with the U.S. policy, right? So U.S. restored hegemony over, over NATO. Uh, and NATO is the foreign policy arm of Europe now. You know, I mean, it's very clear that these, these supranational uh, uh, institutions in Europe, you know, European Commission, European Council, uh, Parliament, European Parliament, European Central Bank now run Europe, right? Uh, you know, the national sovereignty uh, is, is very low in Europe as far as foreign policy is concerned, right? And, and these foreign policy bureaucrats, uh, you know, the Stoltenbergs and the Van der Leydens and all those, those people, uh, they're not elected by the people of Europe, you know? I mean, this is all maneuvers and so forth uh, to uh, get control of policy. Uh, and of course, the U.S. influences them uh, tremendously. They are an expression, you know, of, of the USA now. They do what the USA wants. So that was a great uh, gain uh, by the U.S. Uh, also, the U.S. gained um, uh, in terms of uh, uh, military uh, industrial complex profits. You know, uh, it's not ac by accident that just a few months before the, the onset of the war in Ukraine, uh, the U.S. pulls Health of Skelter out of uh, Afghanistan, right? Remember mm -hmm. that? August of 21. Well, a couple of months later, the U.S. is taunting Russia uh, to uh, invade. The U.S. wanted Russia to invade. It, it enabled so many things, you know, continuation of the war, neocon policy, uh, and uh a testing of, of military equipment, you know, you know, how powerful is are the Russians militarily? Let's let's see what weapons they got and what their uh, logistics are and so forth. And we could test out U.S. equipment too, you know, uh, all the different weapons that we have, you know, from the Bradley vehicles and, and the Abrams tanks and uh, the HIMARS missile, uh, missiles and so forth, right? Uh, so it's the testing ground, kind of like Spain in the 30s was a testing ground of World War II in Europe. Uh, so that was uh, you know, something that was very positive. But basically, the neocons uh, thought, the neocons in the U.S. thought <coughs> that Russia was weak economically, uh, that its military uh, was uh, uh, ineffective, right? Uh, that the oligarchs uh, had the power in Russia and uh, uh, they could get a regime change of Putin here. The old oligarchs would overthrow him uh, if all they did was uh, uh, provoke Russia to war, which would allow them to throw sanctions on Russia and uh, drive Russia out of the European economy, which it did, right? It drove it out, not just out of the energy economy in Europe, uh, dependency uh, of uh, Europe on Russian gas and so forth, uh, drive them out of Europe, and so American companies could, could fill that vacuum, which they have, 
you know, uh, the lack of, uh, uh, of uh, you know, natural gas and oil and so forth uh, that Europe experienced as a result of U.S. sanctions uh, have been filled by U.S. companies, right? U.S. companies provided the, have been providing the natural gas and so forth at a price about four times larger, higher than the Russians did, mm -hmm. which has wrecked the European economy, especially Germany, caused deindustrialization generally. But that has enabled the U.S. to deepen its control over Europe's economy, you see? It's used NATO to deepen control over its foreign political policy, and it's used the war to deepen the control over the European economy. Uh, so those are gains for the U.S. imperialists, no doubt. You know, they've gained more out of not destroying Russia, but by forcing Europe to be more dependent on the U.S. Uh, that, that's a big plus. You know, it has succeeded in sanctions and driving uh, Russia out of the economy, economy of Western Europe. The U.S. has stepped in and, and exercised more control over now. So Europe is more and more dependent on the U.S. in a number of ways than it ever was before. The U.S. has consolidated its imperial influence over, over, over Europe, no doubt about it. Uh, they're a junior partner now, right? Uh, so... Uh, you know, that, that's one of the consequences. Uh, the, the neocons misread Russia. The sanctions did not really work, haven't worked. Uh, Russia found other, other ways to sell even more oil, you know, to the rest of the world. It's gotten around it. In fact, a lot of the Russian oil was sold to the uh, UAE and Turkey and so forth. Mm -hmm. and they just resold it back to Europe at a higher price, you know. Uh, and uh, all these price controls on, on Europe were just nonsense. I mean, on oil were nonsense, and I said so at the time. Uh, you can't legislation control the global price of oil. Uh, it just reveals the, how, how really dumb economically uh, the, the neocons uh, re really were. And they totally misread uh, what, what Russia's strength was. The war has strengthened uh, uh, Putin's regime, no doubt about it. We saw it in recent elections, right? Uh, and it's uh, uh, resulted in, in Russia's economy actually uh, uh, strengthening. You know, the ruble did not collapse. Uh, uh, you, you know, uh, global revenue, oil revenue, and industrial commodity revenue uh, went up. Uh, the GDP now, I think, is like 4 or 5%. We're going to see for last year. At least the last six months, it's been at uh, four or five percent. Uh, the currency is 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 stable, and Russia has mobilized war mobilized its economy over the past year, year and a half. Unlike the West, which hasn't mobilized <laughs> its war economy. Uh, I mean, the U.S. can't even provide, and Europe can't even provide artillery shells for the Ukrainians. It's got to try to go around the world and buy up, uh, you know, from international arms dealers, whatever artillery shells that might be existing around the world, whereas Russia is producing a million shell, uh, shells a year. And uh, now is, uh, in terms of artillery, is, is out producing uh, uh, the Ukrainians like five to one. And it's an artillery war, by the way. It's a missile artillery war. It's, it's not a war like World War II, where you have these huge tank formations you know, sweeping across the plains of uh, Ukraine and Russia. Uh, no, it's a drone war. It's an artillery war. Uh, it's a smart bomb war. It's a missile war. Uh, it's a surveillance war. Uh, and all wars, as they go on, whoever outproduces the other usually wins. And very clearly, uh, uh, Russia has internal lines of communication and production and, and uh, logistics and a big advantage to it, uh, as opposed to, uh, uh, you know, uh, Ukraine, which is dependent on getting arms from the West. At first, you know, it was able to get arms from the West because the old USSR stockpiles of weapons in Eastern Europe uh, were simply just, just uh, you know, shuffled off to Ukraine, uh, but they burned through all that. Uh, now they need uh, more production, uh, more ammunition, and the U.S. and Europe is just not up to producing the ammunition, and they've reduced their stockpiles, and uh, now they're, you know, wondering, do we keep, you know, dipping into our stockpiles of weapons, you know, when we're trying to prepare for a conflict in the Middle, uh, Middle East here and uh, uh, with China, right? 
So the U.S. military elite saying, you know, enough's enough here. We've thrown too much. And there is no military production uh, to speak of in Europe because Europe has relied on the U.S. military umbrella for decades, you know, and, they, and they've, uh, that's allowed them to uh, keep their social programs, uh, not engage in social austerity at the cost of, you know, not, not having to throw money at the military. But that's ending now. And Europe is going to have to try to find a way to do both. Uh, which it's not going to be able to do. But the point is, uh, the West has not mobilized, uh, you know, for war, uh, whereas Russia has. Uh, and uh, very clear, that's that's a big advantage. Uh, they're running out of weapons, and, and there is no air defense anymore, missile air defense to speak of in, in Ukraine, which means the Russian uh, uh, Air Force is just running amok wherever it wants, dropping these 1,500-pound bombs on the uh, infantry uh, you know, in these uh, trenches, uh, Ukrainian infantry just devastating the hell out of them. Uh, there is no, uh, uh, you know, Russia has total air superiority and it's bombing the hell out of everything. And that's why it's winning on, on the front. And there will be a, a major uh, offensive very soon coming in the north and probably in the south, in Ukraine as well. Uh, and, you know, I predict that uh, if this continues in this direction, the Ukrainian army uh, is going to uh, engage in a massive retreat here back to the Dnieper River sometime this summer. Uh, and then the game is over pretty much when, when that happens. Uh, but, you know, it was a, a, a big mis misreading uh, by the neocons of uh, the capabilities of Russia from the very beginning. You see, the neocons uh, wanted a return of, of a Russia the way it was in the 90s when uh, it was uh, totally, uh, uh, you know, under the economic influence of the U.S. and the West because it was in a terrible depression, economic depression, the 90s, as a result of uh, the, the collapse of the Soviet Union. And uh, the U.S. had promised, U.S. statesmen have promised uh, uh, Russia that NATO would not move east, mm -hmm. you know. And then uh, NATO began to do just that, uh, its dress rehearsal was to uh, bomb the hell and break up uh, Yugoslavia. And uh, that success led them to, okay, now we can, the neocons under, under Clinton, now we, now we can uh, expand NATO East when they had promised they wouldn't. That begins in 1999. Uh, it expands throughout the, the Bush period, uh, moving East in, in groups, you know, Poland, Czech, first and then uh, uh, Romania and Bulgaria and then the Baltics and so forth. And, uh, uh, you know, they thought they could just keep moving east and uh, they tried to, uh, to do that in 2005 and eight, uh, promising Ukraine they'd move east, uh, Ukraine could join. And then they tried it with Georgia, you know, in the Caucasus that ended up in a total debacle for them. Uh, so the Ukraine uh, did not get, I mean, NATO did not get to move east uh, to Georgia. That was a dress rehearsal. Chechnya was a dress rehearsal uh, to what's going on now in Ukraine. Uh, and the coup in 2014, very clearly engineered by the U.S. using, uh, you know, street thugs, neo-Nazi nationalists, right, as part of the hammer to pull off a, 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 a coup. You know, they tried to do it in 2005 with the Orange Revolution, but they ended up with an election that was kind of a stalemate. You know, the eastern part had a, the same number of votes as the western part. And we had a period uh, for almost a decade in which uh, uh, the pro-West neocons and the pro-Russian uh, presidents, you know, were, won narrow victories back and forth, back and forth, and nothing really changed. The Orange Revolution in 2005 did not get them the results they wanted. And that's why when they had the, in 2013, another such, you know, narrow win for the uh, pro-Russian Yanukovych, right? They said, oh, we don't want to do this anymore, Victoria Nuland said. Uh, so they had a coup after the election. You know, actually the uh, the fellow there was sort of, well, he wasn't really pro-Russian. He wanted to uh, deal with Europe. He wanted a trade deal with Europe and he wanted to keep a trade deal uh, with Russia. So he tried to have a neutrality thing, uh, but the U.S. neocons didn't want neutrality anymore. Uh, they wanted to break Ukraine off and they saw the opportunity to do it uh, and they did it.
and and then uh, you know Russia immediately uh, uh, protects its naval base there in Crimea, uh, and uh, in, in response uh, uh, to the 2014 coup. Uh, goes and uh, takes takes back Crimea, uh, and then there is some fighting going on in the east. Uh, other uh, in the Donbass, other regions wanted to do the same thing, and uh, uh, you know Ukraine said, "No, no, we're not letting you break away." Uh, and what what you got out of that was the Minsk Agreement, right? Uh, sort of a truce, uh, but as it was revealed uh, a couple of years ago. Uh, by the parties to that truce, Angela Merkel, Chancellor of Germany, and Francois Hollande, uh, President of France, was they viewed Minsk as just a temporary uh, uh, agreement that the, to buy time, these are their words, to buy time to uh, arm the Ukrainian army so that it could take back these provinces in the east that were trying to break away, and Crimea, by the way, right? So it was just a subterfuge. You know, and so you got Russia that was promised, so oh, no, no NATO East. Oh, OK, uh, that was broken. And then you got a Minsk agreement. And no, oh, that turns out that the, the, they were lying and they admit it here. Uh, and, and then you got uh, what happened in, uh, in uh, the first couple of months of, of the Ukraine war in April 2022, in which uh, there was an agreement between Ukraine and Russia uh, for a compromise. That meeting uh, immediately held, as, as we know, you know, in February 22, uh, Russia invaded and, uh, uh, you know, took, took back a lot of, a lot of uh, uh, land uh, and uh, it looked like it was going to sweep across all of Ukraine and uh, Ukraine agrees to, to negotiations in Istanbul with Russia and the deal was, was worked out. The deal was... Uh, Okay, you know, Crimea remains in Russia because it always had been Russia, and we're not going to give up our naval base. You know, it's like the U.S. giving up Pearl Harbor, right? <laughs> and uh, in in the eastern provinces, there was like a, a partial autonomy, right? That uh, those provinces in the Donbass, Luhansk, and Donetsk would remain in Ukraine as part of Ukraine, but they would have some autonomy in their language and so forth. Uh, that the nationalists, you know, the Nazis, the Banderists, uh, uh, didn't want. They, they wanted to ban the Russian language and ban the Orthodox religion and so forth. Uh, and, uh, but there was a compromise that was worked out. It was taken back to Zelensky uh, in April, uh, but it looked like uh, as Ukraine was possibly going to agree to that compromise, in comes Boris Johnson, you know, who was PM of, uh, of Britain at the time, in comes Warren Johnson, immediately flies in and says, no, no, don't sign this. Uh, look, Russia is weak. Uh, we're going to give you all the weapons you want, all the money you need. You know, let's fight Russia here. Let's defeat them. They can be defeated. That was part of this neocon misreading of Russia, right? We're going to defeat them. Let's go to war, right? Uh, and Zelensky bought, drank the Kool-Aid, right? Because there was a lot of money, you know, that came in with that, and a lot of that got siphoned off by the elite in Ukraine. Who knows where it went? Right? We'll find out eventually. <laughs> uh, so, you know, you've got uh, uh, the war continuing, and the U.S. throws a lot of money, a lot of weapons, a lot of advisors uh, into the war. Uh, and, uh, you know, the rest is history. Some offensives that work and don't work and so forth. Uh, but in the long run, strategically, Ukraine, even with the backing uh, of the long supply lines of the, of the West, which ran dry pretty quick, uh, uh, could not win that war. By the way, you can read all of this analysis of what happened from, from uh, you know, late 2021 up to uh, the present after two years in an article I wrote it's on my blog called uh, The Ghost of Clausewitz in the Ukraine War. Clausewitz, of course, was a military theorist during the Napoleon uh, uh, period, uh, which who has influenced a lot of Western thinking uh, about uh, militarily uh, how to, you know, engage and run a war. Uh, and uh, I'd say the ghost of Clausewitz, uh, because uh, clearly uh, Ukraine and NATO has violated the, the principles of war here. Uh, in, in conducting this, which means they are doomed to lose. Uh, 
you know, concentration of forces and mobility and surprise uh, and uh, lines of communication and uh, uh, intelligence and so forth. These are all principles of war that Clausewitz uh, wrote about and others since then, you know, including uh, in World War I, uh, Lydell Hart, the, the British guy, you know, and uh, Bao Zedong and uh, uh, Jap, uh, you know, all these guys just, just applied the principles of war and, and, and therefore uh, prevailed. Uh, and uh, the neocons, of course, uh, uh, totally mis misread uh, and violated the principles of war in engaging in this conflict in Ukraine. Uh, and that's why they're losing. Uh, and this thing will, will come to a head you know, within a year at the latest here, and, and this war will end one way or another. Uh, although, you know, the wild card is Europe. You know, Europe's going to be left holding the bag here because the U.S. is, is going to withdraw uh, uh, very clearly, uh, as it typically do does. You know, it tries out these proxy wars. If they don't work out, well, they just withdraw, and the U.S. isn't all that worst off, you know. But those who are left, you know, have, have a mess on their hands. <laughs> and Europe is going to uh, e either uh, find a way to fund and, and man uh, this war with troops, you know, we see uh, all this talk now about Macron of France sending French troops, right? Uh, NATO troops uh, into Odessa and so forth. Uh, not clear whether it's true or not, but there's some talk about that. Uh, so Europe is struggling to find a way, you know, if we get left uh, holding the bag, because that's certainly going to happen if Trump wins, and it looks like he is, then uh, what are we going to do, right? Uh, are we just going to cut and run? Uh, well, wow, that's going to be the end of our, our political careers. You know, and remember, this is like the super uh, national elite uh, making all these decisions, right? In Europe, in the European Commission and uh, Council and so forth, right? Uh, and, uh, you know, their days are numbered if that happens. Well, NATO may be numbered uh, if, if clearly it's a loss. And, and that's what they're worried about. Uh, you know, what happens to NATO? What happens to our careers? You know the van der Leydens and all those people, right? The beer box and the and the uh, uh, Stoltenbergs, you know, the, the, and, and the Macrons, right? The Macron uh, and Stoltz. I mean, Schultz is is a DOA politically. It's only a time before he's uh, uh, out of there, and uh, Macron's in big trouble now. Well, what did they do when they their political situation is trouble because of in trouble because of a war? Well, they find a way to continue the war, right? I mean, it's just just like uh, Zelensky's doing, and, and like Netanyahu's doing. Mm -hmm. you know, they find a way to continue the war uh, and try to continue, uh, you know, their their control over the, over the situation. Well, that's the, that that's the situation uh, as I see it. Uh, in, in Ukraine, uh, but it has great consequences because we've got associated with it all of the sanctions, right? And the economic war between the West and, uh, and Russia, and now the increasingly obvious uh, NATO conflict with, with Russia. This, this is a proxy war between NATO and Russia. Russia knows that. And increasingly we see a, a drift towards the use of uh, uh, more NATO troops in this now, mostly mercenary and uh, transfers from the French Foreign Legion, you know, uh, and, and that's probably why Macron's pissed off with the Russians, you know, and trying to rattle his little saber, uh, because uh, the Russians found that this this very large French contingent of the French Foreign Legion uh, and uh, volunteers, right, who uh, uh, joined the Ukrainians and. Uh, uh, help the Ukrainians uh, with their uh, recent effort to um, send drones and uh, artillery and so forth across the R Russian border, you know, which is kind of, uh, which has been going on. And now we got a small offensive by uh, Ukraine on the, on the Russian border there near Belgorod, right? Uh, and it, it's kind of like the, the, the net that's been uh, uh, bothering uh, you know, Russia and Russia has been swiping it away uh, uh, one at a time. And now Russia has said, well, enough's enough. And they're going to invade in the north and create a large uh, a buffer zone as a result. Right. But in the process of this, Russia found out that the French foreign legionnaires, mercenaries uh, were playing a big role 
uh, in uh, helping the Ukrainians in, in the north of Ukraine. And uh, when they found this out, they, they sent uh, you know, some very large missiles and uh, wiped out uh, a lot of these, uh, hundreds of these uh, French volunteers uh, and really publicized to the world that, uh, look, the French are here, right? Macron is trying to play a game with us, you know, and uh, uh, expose the French role. And well, you know, now the emperor had no clothes. So let's just, uh, Macron says, well, let's just send uh, French troops, you know, and he's been raising that trial balloon here for a couple of weeks. Uh, it hasn't gone over very well throughout Europe. Uh, the, even the Poles and the Germans said, no, no, we don't want to send fresh, uh, clear NATO military formations into Ukraine. That, that's an escalation we don't want, right? But the crazy Baltics said, yeah, let's do it, you know, and Czech, the Czechs said, yeah, let's do it. So you got this uh, uh, coalition of France, Czechoslovakia, and the Baltics that wanted to send NATO troops because it's pretty clear Ukraine's running out of troops, pretty clear. Uh, you know, Russia says it's got 600,000 combat troops now in, in Ukraine, and estimates of the Ukrainian force is about 300,000 and declining. Uh, and they haven't, Ukraine hasn't been able to mobilize. They have this law, they're trying to mobilize the draft and so forth, uh, but it's very contentious and they haven't been able to pass it. You know? So in, in flies Lindsey Graham last couple of days saying, oh, you got to draft these people, right? Yeah, the U.S. is cutting off the money, and Lizzie Graves said, you got to draft these people, including women and students, right? Uh, well, there's a big political fight in Ukraine uh, over that. Ukraine is running out of weapons and ammunition, and they're running out of troops. Well, that's, that's very clearly a, a road to a defeat here. It's just a matter of, of time. Uh, and that's the situation, as, as I see it, uh, in, in Ukraine. Read my articles on it, and you know, hopefully, I'll have a book out. I, I'm waiting for the end of that whole thing uh, before I actually produce something. Because now we got strategies clearly shifting in Ukraine on all sides, right? On all sides, they're shifting. We're in a real flux period here, and we'll see how it shakes out uh, by the end of the year, certainly early next year. Uh, but by then, uh, you know, early 25, this war will be over. Russia clearly will have won, unless the neocons and the Europeans are so desperate uh, that they send troops, NATO troops, into Ukraine, and then we will be even closer uh, to a very serious World War III. You know, it's kind of like a, a, a simmering a world war going on. It's like, uh, uh, as I said, this is like Spain uh, in the 30s, right, where the fascists and the, and the communists were testing each other out, right? Uh, and well, maybe even, uh, you know, uh, an early Poland, you know, when Poland was invaded by the Nazis, it took nine, what, six or nine more months before the real, the real war uh, erupted, right? Uh, so, you know, this might be like October of 1939 that we're in. Anyway, those are, are, are these, you know, interesting analogies here. You can't make too much analogy with uh, World War II because of, you know, technology is so different now, and the war is really technologically different, uh, and increasingly so, rapidly so. You know, the, the era of uh, uh, big infantry and armored uh, columns uh, uh, sweeping, uh, you know, across uh, planes, uh, that's never going to happen again, you know. Uh, and it's even more devastating kind of a war uh, than uh, it's been. I mean, look, look at the death killed in action and totally wounded, you know, I mean, uh, estimates are on the Ukraine side, anywhere from three to 400,000, right? Uh, and on the Russian side, at least 50,000. And that's, you know, within two years, you know? Uh, I mean, that, that's an incredible death killing rate. I mean, the killing fields are, are just devastating in this modern warfare. Uh, anyway, uh, that's the way I see the Ukraine conflict. As far as um, the circus shows, what I allude, it, um, when we allude to the presidential, um, this four year cycle is really just a circus show. I think I want to save that for a later time because I really want it, since you're on right now, I want to get your opinion on this 
because when we talk about the world of geopolitics, especially, um, we you already alluded to the fact that the mainstream media, media in general, is very much suppressed. Um, and the unfortunate part is that, and the dangerous component of censorship is that a lot of times you don't even realize it's happening especially if you're following those mainstream channels of communication. With someone like yourself, and I know where you stand as far as like, you're very informative. To, to me, I don't know how anything in this interview will be misinterpreted as showing an affiliation towards a certain type of thought process. But unfortunately, we're in an age now where you can't even speak freely geo about geopolitics without people tagging you with labels. If you speak about China, if you come in on China, you're a China puppet, you're a CCP puppet. If you talk about Russia, just give them commentary, you're a Putin puppet. Um, what would be your advice to people who are not the trolls? Because we know, I know you get trolls all the time in your X feed and everything else. But this is for people who may be a little bit more ignorant in the world of geopolitics, but they don't necessarily have a view one way or the other. What would be your advice or your message to people like that when it comes to commenting geopolitics involving China, Russia, despite all the censorship and all the pigeonholing that's going on? RT was banned in the U.S., for instance. How do we reach out to people like that and just tell them that, your own media is kind of programming what you're supposed to think. Yeah, well, you know, if you want to find the truth, uh, you got to be critical of what you're told. First of all, criticism is, is, is a necessity. Uh, you got to understand uh, who's behind uh, whoever's telling you something, you know, giving you a narrative. You know, who's behind it, right, is, is important. Uh, the mainstream media is corporate America, you know, uh, MSNBC, CNN, you know, Washington Post, all those, that's corporate America. And uh, they are tightly controlled more than ever before. I mean, I remember during, uh, you know, the Vietnam War, uh, the media was not as tightly controlled. You know, they used to show uh, uh, U.S. bodies piled on tanks and so forth. Uh, the media had some independence uh, in, in that time period, uh, but it's been tightened uh, ever since as the media has been concentrated into the hands of fewer and fewer. Talk about the mainstream media, right? And then you got social social media, uh, where you know you got entities like Facebook, which is doing whatever the government wants them to do. And then you got uh, Twitter, which is uh, you know a little more independent here. Uh, I remember, um, you know, I've been on Twitter for some time, and I remember uh, before Bus took it over, uh, they were editing and stopping all kinds of uh, you know stuff that people were were posting you know innocuous kind of things i don't know what their 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 model was for for, for you know stopping certain tweets uh, but but it was really crazy uh, but as uh, you know one thing you can say for uh, uh, for musk here i'm not a musk lover but uh, you know clearly it's more open than it's ever been before you're not getting a, a, a lot of uh, negative uh, you know intervention here uh so uh you know there are ways and places uh there are still places on the internet where you can uh get foreign youtube uh, uh you know interviews you know uh and independent and and good sources i mean don't believe any one uh, uh but avail yourself of all different directions and sources and then make up your own mind about what's what's true or not you know uh i i'm not a putin lover uh i i don't love uh, russia i don't hate america right i live here uh my family is here and everything uh but it's not a question of, of love or hate of countries it's uh politicians and their programs and and their policies and one thing I am opposed to very clearly in, in my narrative is that uh, I'm against the U.S. empire uh, because it's destroying our country. It is destroying our country economically, uh, you know, spending trillions of dollars every year uh, and uh, it's destroying our democracy. Uh, so uh, both politically and economically uh, and socially, uh, 
uh, it's very destructive uh, to our own way of life. So I am I'm an opponent of that, no doubt about it. And you know, I don't uh, I don't pull any punches in saying uh, you know I'm not. Uh, and and you know, I I have no no vested interest in in anything. I'm I'm retired. I I don't have to worry about what my academic employer uh, feedback. Uh, from APAC might be if I say something about uh, uh, Gaza and the genocide going on there. Uh, I'm not in any political party where I, I'm trying to follow the line of the party. Um, you know, I'm, I'm really quite free <laughs> in terms of my opinions and, and we'll keep it that way. I just tell it as I, I research it and, and as I see it. And I don't really give a damn, uh, you know, what people think and who I please or don't please. You know, I'm not here to please anybody. I'm here to share what I think is a, a, a more accurate view of what's going on in the country and the world. And that's, that's my only, only objective here uh, at, at this particular point. Uh, so, you know, to, to answer your question, uh, I would say to people, find alternative views and make your own assessment of them. And, uh, Find these views. Uh, who uh, who do they represent, right? And uh, what interests are they speaking on behalf of? You know, some of them may be pro-Russia, right? And so you take it uh, with a grain of salt. You know, oh, Russia said that uh, five thousand Ukrainians were killed here last week. Well, you know, that's probably not true. Uh, but when Zelensky says oh, fifty were killed, uh, that's probably not true either, right? So uh, make your own judgments from multiple sources. Be critical of all of them. Don't trust 100% any of them, right? Uh, but take in all the information and assess it for yourself. That's, that would be my answer for that. Yeah. Um, as far as the election upcoming is concerned, uh, uh, you know, we'll have a longer show on that, I'm sure. Uh, but uh, basically, you know, U.S. elections are now deter national elections come down to seven states that's it oh god the, gerrymandering, <laughs> the gerrymandering and uh uh the control of the narratives and messages uh and everything uh you know is is really you know as it has been from 2016 not much has changed from 2016 by the way we saw the same issues in 2020 and uh Biden probably won because of COVID at that time uh, and the mail-in ballots and so forth, right? He doesn't have that advantage right now. And if you look at the seven states, he's running behind. And in some of them, way behind, double digit, like Arizona, Nevada, Georgia, he's way behind. And he had to win all those in order to win the presidency. And he's marginally behind in, in Wisconsin and uh, uh Michigan and Pennsylvania, right? Those are the six or seven states that were throwing another one somewhere, uh, maybe Virginia, right? I don't know. Uh, and that's where it's gonna be determined as it was in 2020 and as it was in 2016. Mm -hmm. uh, and he's behind, he's definitely behind. Uh, the efforts to legally uh, put Trump, uh, you know, behind an eight ball have, have backfired, they haven't worked. Right. Uh, we've got the issues of Biden's age, which is obvious. Right. Uh, I mean, it's really something when you got octogenarians running the show in the U.S. during this critical period. I mean, the parties don't really let uh, they're so managed from the center, from their committees, that they really uh, uh, are just hanging on to the old the old guard. You know, no new ideas. The old guard means no new ideas. And, and that's what we've got, we've got going on, I think, a lot. Uh, and, uh, you know, the Democrats are doing everything they can to prevent any third parties playing any role. You know, they're squelching democracy. They're, they don't allow uh, uh, any uh, challenging within their own party with the primaries and so forth. Uh, and the Supreme Court says, uh, well, you know, they don't have to be democratic, right? They're clubs. That's what they said. The parties are really clubs. They can run by any rule they want. <laughs> Believe it or not, right? They're clubs. Uh, and, uh, 
you know, the Democrat club is doing everything to, to uh, uh, keep people off the ballot, third parties off the ballot, whether it's Greens or JFK, Junior, RFK Jr., you know, or uh, who, who, whomever here. Uh, and uh, the Republicans, of course, were uh, trying to uh, outmaneuver the big Republican money was trying to outmaneuver Trump. Well, that that collapsed. You know, Trump is the nominee, no doubt. And uh, a lot depends what happens between now and, and November. It, it, it can be very chaotic. I think this is going to be, I mean, we thought 2020 was chaotic. I think this is going to be even more chaotic and uh, 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 even a greater risk to U.S. democracy. You know, uh, I'm not a Trump supporter. I'm not a Biden supporter. I think both of them are disaster, just different forms of disaster to the U.S. here. Uh, but the, neither of those parties will allow any challengers. You know, the Republicans gerrymander the hell out of everything and uh, voters suppress everything and wherever they can. The Democrats go after independence and try to, uh, uh, you know, legislate ballot access, you know, and court ruled ballot access. It's all part of the decline of democracy going on in this country. Uh, that's very worrisome, you know. And the media is is just a henchman in the whole mainstream media in the whole process, you know. It, it's a it, it's a foreboded uh, foreboding situation. Uh, I mean, we talked a lot about economy, but the political system, domestically and foreign policy, is in crisis as well. I think, in both cases. Uh, anyway, uh, I'm sure we we can talk some more about the, the election which I continue writing some things about here as well as it goes. I've been writing on these elections, articles on these elections since 2008 and continue to do so, which is kind of a, a, a reflection of the decline of democ electoral democracy mm -hmm. going on in this country. That continue. It's part of the, the, the decline of neoliberalism. As I've argued in my books, neoliberal economic policies and wealth uh, making your wealth for the one percent uh, cannot continue uh, with democracy, right? Uh, it has to find and is finding a way uh, to circumscribe democracy and democratic norms in order to continue. Uh, so the political crisis is a reflection of the economic crisis and the global empire's crisis. Something that you said, I actually want to, um continue this a little bit longer if possible because um you recuperated some points that I've been making, especially the earlier stages of this forum, um, not so much uh towards the middle and progressing along because um I don't want to make everything um about like just we know that Congress is a mess. I think it has 14% popularity overall. Um, we know that the president really has very, very limited power compared to Congress, even not. But we put so much emphasis on the president, which is just a figurehead, in my opinion. I mean, technically, commander in chief, but honestly, can't well, write bills. The last um, guy who thought he was president was JFK. Was that? JFK. He's the last guy who actually thought he was president and acted like he thought right. he was president. Right? Mm -hmm. Ever since then, I, I think they've been increasingly uh, presidential. Uh, uh, scope of action and what a president can do has been increasingly circumscribed uh, mm -hmm. by other forces uh, within, and not just government forces, but, uh, you know, there is this thing called the deep state. There is something. No that, doubt. Whatever it is. But going to what you were saying about electoral, the gerrymandering, I want to tell you guys something on Beautiful People. I'm going to get a guest on to specifically, to specifically address uh, and who has published extensively about the Electoral College, um, like it's in the form of long form book. And I say that because um, I think that that's a misconception. The Electoral College, as far as I'm concerned, is not an issue. Um, the system is what it is. We know what the system is. Ever since we've been born, we've used the Electoral College. The Electoral College benefits the two-party system. I don't know why people fall into that trap thinking that they really want to change the electoral college. Do you really believe that they want to change the system that's benefiting them? We have 50 states, as Dr. Rasmus was saying, every election comes up in the eight or nine battlegrounds by design. 
because they don't want to campaign all states. Why would they want to campaign and waste their money on all 50 states? So the Electoral College benefits them because they can pinpoint certain states that they need to win the election. There's just a back and forth cycle every time. They already kick people off the ballots, or if they don't kick them off, they make the rules so ridiculous to the point where people who want to run for office aren't incentivized to, even if they file for the Federal Election Commission. For me, a real de democratic process would be if you declare candidacy for president, you file with the Federal Election Commission, you're a viable candidate. But what happens? They don't get any uh, mainstream attention. They get completely suppressed by the media, no visibility whatsoever. They create these arbitrary rules for you to get on stage with certain news networks. All these presidential commissions are ran by the two parties. So we can't even talk about democracy because the system is already designed for the red blue team to be in power each cycle, even at the local levels is bad. You can't, I can't even think of um, my local PSL chapter, my local Green Party chapter, my local Libertarian Party chapter. And these are some of the more elevated known minor parties. And so we have a lot of issues um, going into this um, future. I would say, I also wanna make a comment that this is the biggest opportunity in my lifetime, I think, to see where the country is, the pulse of the country, when it comes to outside of the blue-red team. If we don't get 5 to 10% nationally, um, and I'm speaking to independents and minor party candidates, I think we're in some serious trouble. Um, I think this is the greatest opportunity ever. We see that the leadership is the weakest it's ever been in both parties. I mean, you got a president that's basically, they're trying to put him in jail, uh, prison, they're talking about putting him into prison, beating the other guy behind bars because he's so damn incompetent. He doesn't know where he is half the time. See now, and it's just, that's just being honest. I mean, and, and people will, will say whatever they want to say about me, but we know that Biden is incompetent. It's just a reality. I don't care if you like him or not, he's incompetent. That's all I can say about it. But we just have... Um, 2024 is going to be quite revealing, to your point, and um, I'm I'm here for it. Um, I don't know what's going to happen. I have a suspicion. I think Trump is probably going to be reelected more than likely. I mean, I don't see any other in it, indication that anything is going to happen outside of that opinion. But we will see. Things have happened before, and um, things are definitely set up to happen in 2024. But um, just be careful with the electoral college talk. Because if Trump wins again, it's going to come up again. It's because he won because of the Electoral College, which is bullshit. The Electoral College benefits the two parties. It has nothing to do with that. And, and both parties know this going in that the Electoral College is the system that we're with. So yeah. I just think it's an excuse. Yeah, well, you know, you, you, you said it correctly. Uh, neither party wants to get rid of the Electoral College. They, they both want it. Right. <laughs> they want to keep it uh, because it's a last uh, safety valve. It's a check and balance. I mean, you look at all the opposition to uh, billionaire uh, Republican Party uh, candidate Trump. You, know, you can just imagine if it were a real independent or a socialist, what they'd be doing to their democracy and electoral college. Right. Uh, the, the system was set up with, they say, checks and balances. But really, it's a way of uh, maintaining rule. Uh, should the electorate uh, really turn um, militant, you know, and opposed. There's lots of ways the Supreme Court and so forth and uh, uh, a lot of checks. It's not just the uh, Congress and the House and the Senate, right? The whole system is set up uh, and the Electoral College is, is, is part of that. Look, you got you, you to gotta think in, a, in new terms. You got to think that the, the, this two-party system is not a two-party system. It's a single party with two wings, right? And uh, they represent uh, a little different weights in terms of the population and their interests, right? But on certain issues, they are in total agreement, like on foreign policy of the empire and so forth. The two wings are in total agreement. Now look, look what's happening with Israel, right? You think that there's an opposition here? There's no opposition here, 
right? They're in total agreement on that. Right? Uh, there's splits now, uh, you know, over the Ukraine thing. They're in total agreement about China and going after China, right? There are two wings of the same party uh, that uh, uh, in the 21st century are engaging in kind of a political food fight, right? Uh, and uh, developing certain uh, certain policies that differ over domestic issues that there's some disagreement on, right? And and that's what we're 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 seeing. You know, I mean, the immigration is a domestic issue, right? Uh, uh, gay rights and whatever, that's a domestic issue. Mm -hmm. uh, religion, that's a domestic issue, right? Crime and so forth. So they'll fight over those issues and they've created their own uh, uh, dueling ideologies to justify it. You know, on, on the Democrat side, you got all the wokeism and identity politics, right? And on the Republican side, you got QAnon and conspiracy theory. <laughs> and all of this is what I call the great distraction. You see, this is how the two sides compete now. So they don't have to compete over real issues of, uh, you know, what's happening to the middle class and working class, what's happening to our jobs, what's happ happening to uh, uh, technology and society, you know, and uh, the culture and things like that. They don't have to talk about that. You know, they can talk about they create and and their controlled media creates these issues and makes you think that's how you got to choose between the two wings and it doesn't matter on the really fundamental things of who gets rich and what wars and the empire because both of the wings are in total agreement on that but they keep us uh, uh they play us right it's a shell game it's a shell game they play us over these issues, and there's little token differences between them, but on the big issues fundamentally, there's no difference, and they keep us distracted with all these phony social issues, right? Mm -hmm. That we think, uh, you know, whether it's, uh, I mean, they're not totally phony, but what they do is they uh, uh, elevate these issues to the primary issue, uh, a choice of who you want to choose, right? And they got us into this, this game, this electoral game, and we're choosing on things that uh, are not fundamental. We're choosing these politicians and things that aren't fundamental to our real condition, which continues to deteriorate in this country. Deteriorate. Right? Uh, and, that, and that's the way you need to look at it. Right? And both sides want to keep third parties out of this thing. Right? Both sides don't want it. Uh, you know, I, I mean, the Republicans are worried that Trump will be a third party, right? And uh, you know, the Democrats are worried, well, RFK might, you know, upset the apple cart here and whatever. Uh, and then you even got guys like uh, uh, who run as if they are, are, are independent, but they're really part of the Democratic Party, like Bernie Sanders. You know? Oh, God. <laughs> uh, that, that was a big, big phony play there, you know, to keep people tied to the Democratic Party. All right. Oh, he's independent. You know, he talks like FDR. You know, when it comes time to vote, he votes Democrat. Right. And he the, the Democrats allow him to be independent up there in Vermont, you know, and don't run anyone against them as long as he plays ball with them and mm -hmm. doesn't try to expand his social democratic ideas outside of Vermont, you know. And when it comes down to it, uh, you know, Bernie says, oh, vote for Joe, you know, and uh, oh, no ceasefire, right, et cetera. So, I mean, that, that's just part of the manipulation uh, that goes on. And manip manipulation on the right, you know, oh, they're going to run Nikki Haley, you know. Nikki Haley, what? She was throwing a lot of money at her by big, big New York bankers, you know, to funnel it to see if they could challenge uh they knew they couldn't beat Trump, but they hoped that she might get enough delegates so when they got to the Republican convention, uh, they could manipulate that at that point. But uh, she didn't get enough, you know. Uh, so, you know, we're, we're still stuck with, with this uh, shell game that we're the victims of here. But look at the system in terms of a single part, a very clever single party system uh, where you have two wings who are playing this game on us that won't let anybody else in the game, you know, and they're both working overtime and their institutions you know, play ball and help them, whether it's the media institution or the Supreme Court, court system institution or whatever, plays ball with them. Uh, and that's the way it was all set up. Absolutely. Um, open Secrets, uh, we promote that site so much. Um, 
you pretty much see 49, 51% monetary splits between the two parties, 46, 54, um, 50, 50, 48, 52. You kind of get my drift. It's yeah, by design. Well, Goldman Sachs, all these different organizations yeah. are splitting the money both look ways. And system. it's like that on purpose. Yeah, look at the tax system. Both sides have been promoting tax cuts for the rich and the corporations, you know, uh, since 2001, over $15 trillion in tax cuts while we're spending $9 trillion in wars. You know, first time in our history, we never raised taxes to fund the wars. I mean, World War II, we did. World War I, we did. But first time, you know, because we're just printing the money now. That's all, right? Uh, so $15 trillion. Uh, Trump is the latest iteration of that big iteration in 2018, four and a half trillion dollars. Oh, they say it was only 1.9. I've, I've written and showed it was four and a half trillion, right? And here comes, uh, here comes Biden in 2022. He dismantles the social programs for COVID and he gives the money to corporations in tax cuts and in direct subsidies, particularly to tech companies to bring them back home to the US. You know, uh, the latest thing just came out today you know, this CHIP Act, which was part of his 2022 1.65 trillion tax cuts for corporations, they called it, oh, inflation reduction. That's bullshit. <laughs> Not new <to do> inflation, <laughs> right? Uh, and alternative energy, well, you know, the oil companies got as much as, uh, as the wind companies. Uh, so 1.65 trillion in, in uh, subsidies and tax cuts, which is, you know, just following the four and a half trillion of, uh, of, of Trump, you know, and uh, the Democrats don't want to take away the Trump, you know, they talk about it because they know it won't pass, you know, they'll talk about it when they know it won't pass like he's doing now, you know, look at look at uh, Biden's budget, oh, a lot of good things in the budget, he knows that's, the, I mean, that's a marketing document for a 24 <laughs> election, that's all that is, right? So the Democrats and Republicans don't want to take away the tax, the tax cuts and subsidies on the rich, they don't want to do that. Right, they're in total agreement of that. They're in total agreement on a trillion dollar plus uh, defense budget every year. They're in total agreement on that. Right, uh, you know, it, it, it's it's two sides of the same coin. You know? It's no a one, one party system. No doubt. Um, and um, to you WWE fans, if you like wrestling, um, you know there's two main shows. Um, it's all part of the show. You have SmackDown and then you have Raw. Raw being the red and SmackDown being the blue. It's still the same brand, you know, just two different shows, but the same brand. I mean, it's no different. Um, it's probably more of a correct analogy because, I mean, they they make our political system like it's a team sport now. It's absolutely sad, but it kind of goes into what Dr. Rasmus has been explaining. Just um, it's a decline of... Um, of empire is it really is and uh, they had to resort to all these desperate measures and um it's so it seems like they're just more desperate than ever and they're just um messy with it and and, get and and they leave all the tracks behind people are starting to pick up on the, the tracks because it used to be they're a little bit more sophisticated but now they're just reckless when it comes to what yeah, and uh you know as as the water retreats and you see the rocks uh the corruption is becoming more obvious, you know, and both mm -hmm. sides are corrupt as hell, you know, I mean, they're going after Trump because they, you know, and on his taxes, well, every, every business in probably in, in that sector, you know, the real estate sector does the same thing, you know, I mean, there's nothing unique about what he's done with his taxes, right? Uh, and, and then, of course, uh, it's becoming more obvious that there's something there with Biden taking bribes and using his name oh, yeah. and so forth. I mean, that's maybe why he doesn't want to get out of Ukraine, right? Uh, you know, Zelensky may reveal him and Zelensky, you know, doing his corruption. And as I pointed out uh, not, not too long ago in an article that uh, Krumps, uh, Zelensky is running this grift. You know, you, you recall all these Hollywood celebrities going in photo ops, right, in, in Kiev and so forth. Well, it came out, uh, one of these celebrities, the actor Danny Trejo and his, oh, uh, yeah. his, uh, his lawyer revealed what was going on. And uh, in other words, Zelensky was offering these, these uh, celebrities, American celebrities and politicians, I'm sure, to come over and 
uh, do a photo op with him and he'd pay them $100,000. Well, as it turned out, according to Dandy Trejo's lawyer, that uh, when they got there, they were told, uh, well, we're going to give you $150,000, right? Uh, but you got to kick back 50000 of that to me, personally, Zelensky. Uh, and, and that's the grift. Only one of the grifts that were going on. Now, all that was taxpayer money, of course. He's pocketing 50000 at a at a whack. Who knows what other schemes he, he has going, right? Uh, th there's something there about the corruption of, uh, of Biden in Ukraine. There's, there's something there. Time, time will tell. Uh, and uh, it's part of why we're there, I think, in, in Ukraine. Part, not the whole picture. Uh, uh, but then, you know, you got Congress that, that's corrupt as, how, as well. All this insider training going on. Uh, I mean, they're making themselves rich, you mm -hmm. know, and that's why the Democrats have such a connection with, with the uh, Silicon Valley and the, and the tech companies, you know, they're getting, and, and the latest thing came out, uh, Pelosi, uh, who blocked all the insider trading uh, uh, committee investigations going on. She, she just shut those down in Congress, right? Uh, uh, it just came out the other day that uh, one of these tech companies in Palo Alto here in, in Silicon Valley uh, provided, she made a lot of money off of that, right? Well, that was going to be that's that's insider trading for sure, you know. So Congress is corrupt as hell, and the presidents are corrupt. I mean, and you see that this shit was probably going on before, but now when the waters, you know, the rocks rise and the crisis and the waters flow, you see how pervasive the corruption is in the country. A hundred percent. I we always have so much fun when you come onto the show. Um, I'm glad that we were able to talk a little bit there towards the end about. Uh, I mean, it, it sucks because you want to just extract something out of that, you know, but maybe people did extract something out of that. People who aren't into politics the same way we are. And maybe if you take something out of that, um, that's great. But, you know, it's really, you know, it's a little bit more gossipy, I guess, co uh, compared to what we've talked about before on the show. But, I mean, it is an unfortunate situation, um, the corruption. It, it, it's very clear. Um, from my vantage point, but um, I guess it's not so clear to people who are still captured um, by the echo chambers. But um, regardless, we can't wait to have you back onto the show. But um, I just want to give you a last second. I know you've already plugged it in, but just um, if someone had a question or a comment, what would be the quickest way to get in touch with you, Dr. Rasmus? And again, thanks for coming on to this show and making this a one for episode 108. Yeah, well, I comment every day on the news of the day on Twitter. You know, my my handle is uh, at Dr. Jack Rasmus. That's J C K R A S M U S. D R J A C K R A S M U S. Uh, my blog, uh, JackRasmus.com. You know, I post things there periodically, uh, and uh, on uh, my my radio show, Alternative Visions, on the Progressive Radio Network, is every Friday at. Uh, uh, 2 p.m. Pacific uh, Eastern Time, 2 p.m. And that's podcast uh, at uh, alternativevisions.podbean.com. And also, I think it's pod, podcast on Apple and other places. I don't even follow them anymore. So, uh, you know, the, the Twitter, uh, the blog, uh, the radio show, um, read my articles on, on the blog. Uh, they get picked up a lot by uh, Counterpunch and LA Progressive, <clears throat> Zenet, and Common uh, Dreams. Uh, do they? I don't follow Common Dreams, but periodically, probably uh, in, in a lot of places. Uh, my next forthcoming book uh, uh, at the end of the year is going to be The Twilight of uh, American Imperialism, uh, looking at the whole history of U.S. Uh, in, imperialism from uh, the 1760s, 60s, driving Native Americans off their land and Spanish-American War and uh, uh, Central America and uh, globally ever since. Uh, so that's uh, an important uh, publication, I think. And as I uh, alluded to earlier, uh, a book of articles on, uh, on the Ukraine war uh, following that, probably next year, I want to talk about uh, what's happened to the economy in the aftermath of COVID, uh, the U.S. and global economy, and uh, then after uh, you know the crisis in democracy and the elections here, uh, I have a book in mind called uh, uh, 
uh, the life and times of, of democracy, neoliberal democracy. Uh, that will be an interesting thing. Anyway, those are, I'm loaded up. I'm, I'm finishing a memoir here uh, that, uh, and I have a, a couple plays I'm trying to pedal around to theaters. <laughs> but, uh, you know, the theater scene is uh, too, too many actors cast is too large. They, they can't, <laughs> you know, it's, it, it's not the, uh, something I haven't having problems. Uh, I have a, a wonderful musical play uh, simply called 1934 about the uh, San Francisco waterfront in 1934 uh, during the general strike, kind of like a, a Brecht uh, kind of three penny opera kind of a play. Uh, and uh, if anyone's interested in that, uh, please get in touch with me. Uh, my email, if you want to just ask me a question is a, uh, is a, uh, dr jack rasmus at gmail.com okay uh, particularly if uh, you have any ideas uh, you're interested in, in a, a musical play about san francisco waterfront all right uh, or interested in the topic of uh, of the book uh, you're just gonna have to wait for the memoir though that's that's still in progress i'm not dead yet oh no this is a, when, when, it, when is it going to come out the memoir Probably next year. Next year. Okay. Um, beautiful people. Again, wonderful episode 108. I can't wait to replay it. I'll probably publish it tonight. I'm just I'm just really happy with the growth of the forum. I really am. Um, just with the steam guests like yourself. I mean, tomorrow we got Norm Finkelstein coming back on for a third time. Monday we have Jill Stein coming on. Um, we have Dr. Shiva coming on again next month. Uh, we have just a plethora of people. My dad came on for the episode 100, the celebratory episode 100. So we give people, um, some people that I know personally um, that I work with in academia, some people that are activists, strictly activists, some people who are politicians. Um, but most of, pretty much all the politicians that have come on to this show have been non-duopoly candidates, um, which is fine. I mean, that's kind of the purpose of the show. It's a big part of the show in political, um, I guess, topics is um, because we're really trying to push and make a movement, grow a movement outside of the two parties or the one party, whatever it is. But um, you never know who's going to come onto the show. And that's only possible by um, the, the beautiful people who follow the show. And again, just subscribe for free. I don't need any of your money, honestly. I just want um, support like that to where YouTube can pay me. I am monetized technically. Thanks to um, all the support, you know, the subscribers and stuff. So just keep that coming. Subscribe for free. Share the information. Um, tell your friends and family. And remember, you can't unthink free thought. And um, Dr. Rasmus, enjoy your day. And beautiful people, enjoy the rest of your day. Cheers, everybody. <laughs>